Ah, yeah. Chair, okay. could I just say that uh, I have uh, the Aber Valley Heritage Annual General Meeting at 11 o'clock via Zoom, so uh, I'm only with you. Uh, you may be pleased or disappointed to know until 11 o'clock. Sorry. Lindsay, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Hope you're all safe, by the way. Yes, yeah, thank you. Right, um, a very warm welcome um, to this digital meeting of the Voluntary Sector Liaison Committee. This meeting is held via Microsoft Teams today, Thursday, the 28th of January 2021 at 10.30 to consider the, meet the matters contained in the agenda. This meeting will be recorded and made available to view via the Council's website, except for any discussions involving confidential or exempt items. Therefore, the images audio of those individuals speaking will be publicly available to all via the recording on the Council website at www.cafilly.gov.uk. Um, as mentioned earlier, we would prefer if members could keep their cameras on throughout the meeting. Um, but if you do not wish to be visible on the recording, then you can turn your cameras off. Also, if you do have technical difficulties during the meeting, it's often best to turn your cameras off. Um, all members, if you can keep your microphones on mute and only unmute when making a contribution to the meeting, that also helps with the remote workings. Attendees wishing to make a contribution should click on the hands up button on their control bar and the hand sy symbol will be displayed next to that person's name, notifying the chair and the vice chair that they wish to speak. Thank you. To receive apologies for absence, may I ask our support, um, the uh, names of anybody who is absent today, please. Hi, Chair, would you like me to notify you of the apologies for absence? That would be lovely, thank you. Um, yeah, Councillor Cook, Councillor Haas, Cruising Gwent and Kath Peters. I would advise that we are missing uh, one county councillor. Um, I think he should be with us today. I'm not sure, no, I'm just looking. But no, he's not. I don't think he is. But we'll just let you know that we, uh, we are very mindful our councillor Graham Simmons is not well with the dreaded um, it, pandemic illness that is going around at the moment. And our thoughts are with him and his family. He is at the Grange Hospital at the moment. Right, on to the agenda, uh, with, we've done the items for um, declarations of interest. I shall read out this. Councillors and officers are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and or prejudicial interest in respect of any item of business on the agenda in accordance with the Local Government Act 2000 Councillors Constitution and the Code of Conduct for both councillors and officers. Are there any declarations, please? No. I don't notice any, so we'll move on um, to receive and consider the following minutes. Item three, the Voluntary Sector Liaison Committee held on the 5th of December 2019. 
Right, the uh, pages, I shall go through page one, page two, page three, page four, page five. Are there any matters arising from these minutes, please? Yes, I, I've got a matter arising, please, Chair. If, if you Thank lose you, me, my, my sound is 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 quite poor. You've be, uh, been breaking up, so I've had to log out and I've had to log back in. But the, the matters arising is um, on the actual um, service review. Uh, at the last meeting, we had a, a very constructive challenging discussion about the voluntary sector uh, service review and I would like to ask uh, uh, Mr Harris I'm sure he's with us if he would confirm um, the terms of reference of that review the time scale um, the objectives of the service review um, in the transformation agenda and finally uh, Steve um, perhaps you could confirm that I see there's going to be uh, no cuts uh, this year, so there won't be any cuts to the voluntary sector budget in the next financial year. Perhaps you'd confirm. Thank you. Good yeah, morning, everybody. Uh, I'm morning. happy to give a response on that. Um, you're right, Councillor Etheridge, I will be going through the detail of the draft budget on the next agenda item, but currently there are no cuts proposed, um, so that service review is currently paused. Uh, the service review program uh, in light of COVID obviously and other priorities has been put on hold for the time being. Uh, I'm not in a position to be able to tell you at the moment um, when that review will be undertaken, uh, but I can reassure you that there will not be a cut in the funding for uh, the forthcoming financial year. Um, Sue or Kath obviously from the transformation team uh, will keep you up to date uh, on, on the progress and when that review is uh, due to be undertaken. Um, you know, but it will be a very open book approach. It'll be a joint approach to the review uh, and the outcome will be not just obviously looking at the financial side of this. It will be to make sure that the service level agreement is appropriate and is fit for purpose moving forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Stephen. Just 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 a further point, Chair. Um, could we have somebody from the voluntary sector sit on that service review, Steve? And as you know, as you're a genuine person, you you would not rule out additional funding for the voluntary sector as well. I don't want to predict the outcome of the review. Uh, the outcome will be what it is once the work is done. Uh, but I'm sure, as I said, we we haven't even put the group together to do this yet. But it would make perfect sense, obviously. Uh, to have a representative from the voluntary sector on that group, in my view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin and Steve. Um, could I have a mover uh, and a seconder uh, for these minutes, please, members? Happy to move, I'm Chair. Chair. I move the minutes, uh, Chair Walter Williams, Councillor Williams. Thank you both councillors for that. Can we now move on to item number three? Um, four, sorry, and hand over to uh, Mr. Steve Harris. Steve, I think we would have called you the um, treasurer years ago of the council. That would have been the former title. And um, But nowadays things have moved on and you're sort of our chief finance officer, 151 as well. So do you want to just explain that to everybody here, what, what your title actually indicates, please? Yeah, no problem at all. And um, good morning again, everyone. Uh, and just to clarify, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Steve Harris, and my job title is actually the head of financial services and section 151 officer. I guess that's just a grand way of um, saying what the Treasurer's post used to be. So basically Chief Finance Officer for the Council. Um, so I've just been asked to come along this morning uh, and give you a bit of an update on the um, draft budget proposals for the forthcoming financial year. 
and they were presented to Cabinet uh, on the 13th of January uh, and are now subject to a period of consultation uh, prior to a final decision being made on the budget um, in February this year. Uh, we have found ourselves in an unprecedented situation uh, because details of our funding settlement uh, from the Welsh Government are normally received in October each year, um, but the details for 21-22 were not actually received until the 22nd of December. So that left us with very little time to pull together the Council's draft budget proposals. Just to give you some of the headline numbers in the settlement, uh, there was a 4% increase uh, for local authorities across Wales, um, which was clearly very welcomed, uh, given the austerity that we've been facing now for a number of years. But that does vary across authorities, uh, depending on the details of the funding formula. So although the average increase was 4%, for Caerphilly, uh, it's a 3.1% increase for next year, uh, which equates uh, to £9 million in cash terms. The draft budget proposals um, include a proposed increase in the council tax of 3.9%, and that will generate income of around £3.1 million for the council additional income. And we were in a position where we did have some savings in advance uh, from the budget setting process for the 2020-21 financial year, and they can now be released uh, into base budgets to obviously help us um, set a balanced budget from 21-22 onwards. So that did put us in a position where we have additional funding of around 14.1 million uh, for the 21-22 financial year. So given you know, the financial challenges that we have faced for many years, it is very pleasing to note that the 3.1% uplift in the settlement, along with the proposed increase in council tax of 3.9%, will mean that there will be no requirement for any new savings to be identified uh, to balance the budget for the 21-22 financial year. And furthermore, uh, the proposals in the budget report will also maintain service provision across the council. It will fund increasing demand and service pressures in key areas, notably social services and education. And something you'll be interested in is that it will enable new community-focused investments uh, in areas such as Caerphilly Cares, uh, which I understand uh, you'll be receiving a pr presentation on later this morning. And we're also proposing to um, establish a community empowerment fund where members will receive an allocation of around £4,500 each year uh, to work on uh, projects uh, with their local communities. Uh, the budget will also provide the capacity and resilience required to drive forward the Council's transformation programme and our place shaping investments. Uh, which uh, basically will be a programme of investments um, of a capital nature for forthcoming years, uh, details of which will be shared um, with members now over the next uh, uh, six to eight weeks. And also, the budget settlement has allowed us to address legacy issues in some areas where income uh, levels have been falling well below budgeted levels. So it's now obviously uh, given us the opportunity uh, to put that right as well. Um, the Council is on a journey of recovery, uh, obviously from COVID. Uh, we're looking uh, at the improvements in a number of areas and transformation, and the proposals set out in the draft budget report will provide a sound platform for us to move forward now with the ambitious plans for the Council. It is important that I emphasise that the financial settlement does not cover uh, the financial implications of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic both in terms of the additional costs that continue to be incurred by the Council and income losses in a number of areas. These will continue to be funded through grants from the Welsh Government and the position will be kept under close review as we move into the new financial year. Clearly, whilst the 3.1% settlement uh, increase is welcomed, uh, the future funding situation for local government is likely to be challenging uh, due to the unprecedented fiscal impact of COVID-19 and the strain that this will put on public finance, fi uh, finances for years to come. It's also important to stress that at the moment, the UK government comprehensive spending review has only focused on one year, i.e. 21-22. So we have no details at this stage uh, of what funding settlements may look like beyond 21-22. However, in the absence of that information, um, the report presented to the Cabinet on the 13th of January did provide an updated medium-term financial plan, which showed an indicative projected savings requirement of £20.7 million for the Council for the four-year period 22-23 to 25-26.
This is only one potential scenario, which assumes an uplift in WG funding of 1% each year and an increase of 3.9% in council tax. Just to stress that financial forecasting is very sensitive to even minor changes in, in, in assumptions. So for example, a 2% increase in WG funding per annum would reduce the four-year potential saving requirement to 8.8 .8 million instead of 20.7. And conversely, a cash flat position in terms of WG funding would increase the potential savings requirement to 32.3 million. So a range of potential scenarios will be considered uh, as we progress during the uh, coming months. The Council's transformation programme will be the key driver in ensuring that financial resilience is maintained in future years. And the financial position will be regularly reviewed and periodic updates, updates will be provided for members. In terms of the next steps, the final 2021-22 budget proposals will be presented to Cabinet on the 17th of February and then Council on the 24th of February for final approval. Any comments from today's meeting will be incorporated into the final budget report as part of the feedback on the budget consultation process. Thank you, Chair, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, Liz. I think Councillor Etheridge has his hand up. Um, sorry, technical problem no, was, sent. Um, I, I, I think we have Judith. Um, no, I am not. Can I just say we had Councillor Whittle put his hand up first? Then oh, I, is that okay? Marvelous. Thank you, Councillor Whittle. Go ahead. You're on silent. Councillor Whittle, you're on mute. I beg your pardon. Um, it's it's not so much a question, uh, but um, I know that uh, in, in the last couple of years I've been working a lot with the voluntary sector and I know many, uh, well, this entire meeting, of course, has been working uh, with, with the voluntary sector. And I just fear for the, the mental health issues of, of, of Joe Public out there, probably ourselves included, if we were, were being honest, because, you know, many of us have been stuck at home, denied seeing loved ones. I've missed three uh, granddaughters' birthdays uh, this year. Uh, sort of uh, Skype is not the same as a kutch. Uh, we all know this. But but I'm, I'm fearful that many of our volunteers, uh, the older generation by and large, uh, may, may not get back to their volunteering um, roles because they will be so used now to staying at home and uh, maybe still fearing that uh, there is a risk of catching this dreadful disease. And I just wanted to make a plea to every single member and every single voluntary sector represented here today. We've got to push at every opportunity in budgets to ensure that work to assist and working together to, to assist the people to recover from this pandemic, in my opinion, is far more important than fixing a pothole in a road, uh, unless it's a very severe pothole, of course. Thank you, Lindsay. If you could take your hand down button, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for Thank reminding you. me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, Vice Chair, who have we got next, please? OK, I think we had Judith next. Judith. Yes, um, I just wonder whether Steve can reassure us that, in fact, Welsh Government will reimburse all the costs, the extra costs of the COVID um, outbreak. I think I'm quite impressed and, and very relieved that um, the Council don't have to make any cuts uh, this year, especially to the voluntary sector, uh, because in the past this has been quite a big problem. I mean, voluntary sector's lost a lot of... Um, uh, support from the council year on year but I'm just wondering whether Steve feels that we may be hit in the future by a big bill uh, mm -hmm. coming from the um, yeah, Covid situation um, that's the first question second question is about the business support um, grants that we've had from um, Welsh Government and uh, the voluntary sector organisations with their own buildings have benefited from these greatly um, does, does Steve feel that most of the businesses and uh, eligible voluntary sector organisations have actually received this grant? And 
did we have a sort of block grant with money left over that we could spend on something else? Or were we just reimbursed for the total amount um, that people applied for? OK, um, if I deal with the COVID funding in the first instance, uh, to, to their credit, the Welsh Government have been very, very helpful and worked very closely with local authorities throughout the pandemic. Uh, in Caerphilly alone, to date, in the current financial year, we have probably had in excess of £12 million uh, to address additional costs uh, and shortfalls in income. And we are lobbying um, through uh, the Society of Welsh Treasurers, which is all the Section 151s across Wales, uh, we're lobbying uh, with finance colleagues in Welsh Government uh, to ensure that that funding does continue into next year. And clearly, politically, um, you know, the Cabinet member, um, Leonard Stenner, and the leader through their various networks will also be lobbying to ensure that funding continues. It does present a risk because in the current year, the UK Government has allocated around £5 billion to the Welsh Government uh, to uh, deal with the response to COVID. Next year, in the uh, draft budget for Welsh Government, there's only a commitment to provide 766 million at this stage. Now, clearly, that will be based on an assumption that we will start to come out of this at some point. Um, but as I've said, it does present a risk to us. But, you know, if I look at the way Welsh Government have responded to this and work with local authorities in the current year, that gives me some reassurance moving forward. In terms of the business grants, uh, just to give you a bit of an update on that. Uh, we have now uh, issued grants totaling in excess of £45 million in the current year. Uh, we've tried to um, uh, uh, make sure we target that at all the businesses uh, that are entitled, all the voluntary sector organisations. I know members have been active in that regard, and I know, Judith, yourself, you've been very active and you've been working with my team to make sure we get the money out. Um, we were given allocations. Uh, uh, but, but in the end, the money that we actually receive will reflect what we've actually paid out. Um, and if you look out uh, for an announcement tomorrow, uh, there's likely to be when the First Minister, Minister gives his update uh, on the restrictions, there's likely to be an announcement around further funding in respect of business grants. I don't have the details at this point, um, but you know, as soon as we get the details of that, I'll make sure that that is shared with everybody. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, could, could I come back on that? That's very good news, Steve. The last grant that we had, which was £3,000, um, we didn't even have to apply for. I mean, we'd applied for the previous grants. It just appeared in, well, we were told about it. We had an email and it appeared in our um, organisation's bank account. And that yeah. is the most wonderful situation you can possibly imagine. So um, I would very much look forward to a bit of extra money. Some of us have been using some of this money to do up buildings, which is really, really welcome. Thank you. OK, well, well, as we've been paying more and more of these out, because we've been doing it all year, uh, we are in a situation now where when we get new announcements, we know is entitled, so we can automate those payments. And we that, that's why you did get an automatic payment last time. That's great. Can, can we move on to a question from Stephen Taylor, please? Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it was only um, it is a question, I suppose. Um, it's just to give a little bit of a background as well. I think I think it's great to see that there's no cuts. It's fantastic for this year. Um, but just talking about the budget for next year, I think I'm just picking up on um, a Councillor Kevin Etheridge's point, really. I think last year we was involved with the budget. Um, we did meet with council reps about um, about the sort of where the land land laid with the budget and how the budget had been set but i think that what it was is it was a little bit too late so i think where we had some issues as a sector was in regards to some of the waiting that had been done at that time so i think it's a little bit of a plea really is that you know obviously this year has been completely different and like i say it's great to see that there is no cuts and appreciate that it's been a little bit different but if we can get involved next year maybe if we can just sort of come to some agreement that we can get involved around that waiting time so i think that the third sector reps that we had around the table at the time was looking at it in a very different way than maybe local authority members were so it's important to sort of try and share that um share those different viewpoints so it's just to ask if we could get involved a little bit earlier if in, in those budget discussions if possible Yes, yeah, Steve, I'll come back in on that. I mean, you know, you saw the situation we were in this year. We've never been in a situation where we've had the settlement so late. Uh, Councillor Etheridge has already alluded to the, the service review type work that's um, uh, going to come up at some point. And like I said, Steve, we, we'll make sure we're fully engaged with you on that process. 
probably not something I'll be leading myself because I'm no longer in the transformation role that I was doing for some time. Um, but I'm sure the likes of Kath, Peters and Paul will make sure, you know, there's full engagement with, with yourself and your teams. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Etheridge, you wanted to come back in? Yeah, ju just a final point, Steve. I, I think, um, you know, can we have it minuted and, and put on record um, from the Voluntary Sector Committee um, how much we, we appreciate the hard work in staff who's dealt with, you know, giving advice on the on the business grants and to the voluntary sector. Um, you know, I think they, you know, they've been magnificent in, in their response. And also th thanks to the senior officers for fielding my many queries. Thank you. Thanks for that, Kevin, and I'll make sure that's passed on. It's always good to have positive news. People are quick to criticise, so the positive news is welcomed. We have one more question, if that's OK, from Sue Richards. Thank you. Not so much a question, just sort of a, to add to Steve's response. I'm actually at the moment um, interim lead for transformation. So I just wanted to reassure uh, Councillor Etheridge that the review, even though it hasn't started yet, is in the plan. Um, there's a work stream in our corporate reviews called Corporate, corporate Volunteering and Community Partnership. And I would see it being a work stream um, in that review. So thank you for your question. Just to offer you reassurance, Councillor Etheridge. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, everyone. Uh, if those that have still got their hands up button on, could you take your hands down, please? It helps a little with the with the work today. Um, I think um, we would like it minuted, please. Um, <clears throat> the valuable work that the finance department has carried out during the pandemic period with the grants, as Kevin has mentioned, I think we formally would like to place on record. Um, that's my wish anyway. I think I, I would want some support on this from our other members. But it has been absolutely astonishing, the automatic response to the second grants going out. And when you consider £45 million pounds, it's a hell of a lot of money and we've had, you know, such wonderful work done by the department, Steve. So um, I hope this will be supported by our members that we want this in our minutes today because it has kept a lot of people um, going in such bad times. Yeah, thanks again, Chair. I'll make sure those sentiments are passed on to the finance teams. Thank you. Um, I can see Kevin and um, Alison wish to say something. So, Kevin. Yeah, I'd just like to endorse what you said, Liz. Sorry, my, my, my hand, I seem to have a problem um, with sound and hands at the moment. So um, forgive me if my hand goes up. All right. right I don't, thank you. I'm the only child and I don't get out much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Kevin, for that. Um, Alison Palmer, please. Yeah, it was just a comment to say that we have worked really hard to make sure that all the organisations who potentially could benefit from the rate relief grants and stuff have been able to access it. So we're delighted that uh, so many organisations have received the money. And then my other thing was, is that we've just been reminded by Beck that we needed a show of hands to approve the minutes as I'm monitoring the chat column. So I just needed to take us back to that very quickly before we move on. Thanks, Alison. Thank you very much. Right. We had a mover and a seconder of the minutes. It was Councillor Goff, seconded by uh, Councillor Walter Williams. But we do need um, a show of hands. So um, can we do that with a hands up um, feature, please? Just checking the participants column, um, uh, Councillor Allsworth, we have 
quite a lot of hands that you can't actually see on the screen. Mm -hmm. So I think you can assume approved. Thanks, Alison. We've all got to try and put them back down now, though. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And the lower the hand, if you can, please, members. Marvellous. Uh, Wes, thank you ever so much for your time this morning. We know you're one of the most extremely busy officers within the organisation. We've got a lot of uh, meetings coming up. Um, as we well know, but thank you so very much uh, for being with us today and giving such information about the current budget proposals. No problem. And if you don't mind, Chair, uh, I'd like to stay to listen to the Capilli Cares presentation. That would be lovely. Thank you very much, Steve. OK, thank Chief. you all. Thank, thank you. you. We've got a question from Vicky Doyle, unless it's oh. just that um, we've inherited Sorry. No, oh. it wasn't this accident, oh. sorry. <laughs> I'm going to win bingo today, I can see. <laughs> Thank you, members. Right, we're going on now to item five, which is the Caffili Cares presentation. And um, we have uh, our director present today, Mr. David Street, and also another uh, long-standing officer with the council, Miss Tina McMahon. And the presentation will come up on screen. Hopefully, we will be able to share it. And um, over to you, David and Tina. OK, so thank you, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to come along and, and talk to you this morning. Um, Tina is going to be the, the principal driver and presenter, but if I just put this into some sort of context for you, um, you will recall um, that at the start of the pandemic in, in March last year, um, at very, very short notice, a whole range of people across uh, the, the UK had shielding letters from government. Um, and local authorities had to respond very quickly to those people's needs in terms of making sure they had food, uh, making sure they could get to pharmacies and, and lots of other um, lots of other initiatives. Um, Caffili responded to that very quickly, very early on in, in that process. We sent letters out to all the households in the borough saying that if they needed any support, this is who they should contact. And, and from that, as a result of, of a lot of staff coming forward, um, we basically had the Caffili Buddy Scheme that came into position uh, very, very quickly. What we've done um, from that Buddy Scheme is, is to try and take the learning, all the positives, uh, and consider really how do we develop that into what is a, a almost a permanent offer for the citizens of the borough who may find themselves in, in difficulty moving forward. Um, obviously, you know, the pandemic is still ongoing. Uh, we're probably moving into a period of unparalleled economic challenges going forward. Uh, we're starting to see unemployment rise, uh, and there's little doubt that a number of people in our borough, unfortunately, are going to need assistance moving forward. So what Tina will do um, for the next 10, 15 minutes or so is really take you through the Caffili Cares service um, as approved by Cabinet a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we would welcome um, any sort of comments or dialogue moving forward. Thank you, Chair. Over to you, Tina. OK, thank you. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Tina McMahon. Uh, um, the Community Regeneration Manager for, um, for Caffili Council. Um, as of uh, Monday, I'll be moving into social services um, to work with, um, with Dave on, on the implementation of Caffili Cares. Um, as Dave said, um, obviously um, the crisis and through our work that we did on the Buddy Scheme, um, it saw people present themselves to the council, um, many of whom for the first time um, a lot of those individuals did request support directly due, due to COVID-19 and the support that they needed um, because they were shielding. Um, but as we had further and further contact with individuals, we, uh, we identified that a number of people had a number of uh, unmet needs, um, things that they would have previously um, contacted the council for, um, but actually had, had fallen through the net. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, could I have the next slide, please? I think we've frozen. Uh, 
Thank you. Sorry, I'm not sure whether it's me. I, I'm in a very uh, um, unusual situation at the moment, and my connection isn't particularly brilliant. Um, if you could, um, sorry, if you could go, go back one again. Um, what we also saw, though, um, in, in addition to the to the people who presented themselves um, to us uh, for the first time, we, we saw um, a level of resilience um, in our communities, both both individually um, and, and at community level, um, and organisations um, who stepped up um, admirably to, to to the challenges that they faced in their in their communities. We saw local groups, um, ex existing local groups, take up the mantle, and we also saw a number of new groups establish themselves to support their communities for a whole wide range of of issues in fact mirroring a lot of the work that we were doing through the through the buddy scheme um, and I think if it hadn't have been for them we probably would have been overwhelmed as a council in in regards to the support that people needed um, I think and and the um, part of what Kafili cares is about is that the support for these groups moving forward is crucial. Um, it, it's shown how valuable community level support and community groups are um, and how they are actually part of a mix of um, provision that is available to our communities. Um, and in lots of ways, a more sustainable um, approach to, to supporting individuals, um, engaging them back into their communities and providing some more support locally by, by their neighbours and their friends and the people that live in, in their communities. So uh, the next one, please. We may be some time. <laughs> um, what is Kafili Cares? Um, well, it's a number of things. Um, it is a universal um, gateway. Um, it is about having um, contact with people who need support. Uh, um, and as Dave said, there are going to be significant support needs as a consequence of COVID from the number of people that unfortunately are going to be made unemployed to, um, as a point that uh, Councillor Whittle made earlier, the impact on people's mental well-being is going to be significant. The impact of loneliness and, and isolation and, and, on, and that on people's well-being as, as well. So we do see that there are going to be significant numbers of people who are going to need support moving forward. And it's how we provide that support how we provide it straight away at the right time um, and respond as, as quickly as we can. But it's also about providing a wraparound support to, to people, looking at how we coordinate support services so the individual has a holistic um, um, support for their needs. And that support will obviously include community level support as well. So it's how we better engage with and better support our local community groups. Um, it's creating conditions for, for communities to thrive um, and conditions for community and voluntary groups to thrive um, so that, as I said, we can balance the provision between what we provide as service providers and our partners uh, and how we can provide uh, community support. Um, and what, what we are looking at is very much a, a partnership between us and the voluntary sector and obviously Garvo um, and moving forward. Um, that's just um, a sort of... Um, diagram really of, of how it will work and how people will come in um, through an initial gateway which will be um, a number of um, access points both telephone online um, and hopefully when we get back to a little bit of normality um, directly to um, to our community um, hubs and community buildings um, we'll be talking to people about how and what service needs they want very much led by the individual rather than led by the service um, and then referring to the most appropriate services for those individuals. What we will also be doing is keeping um, a record of people's um, um, support experiences and how they can be changed and, and reflect the needs of that individual more appropriately moving forward. And next one, please. This is very much in line with the council's uh, strategic recovery framework um, uh, for which is which is Kafili Cares, um, how we use resources more appropriately, how we strengthen our relationship with our communities, um, and how we look at the valuable input from volunteers, both vo both volunteers externally, but also volunteering for us as a, as um, as a local authority, um, and the policy that's been developed around that, um, so that we can have more. 
um, appropriate collaborations and partnerships with our communities. And then next one. So what's the progress been to date? Um, as Dave said, obviously the council set up the buddy screen um, very quickly at the start of the pandemic. Um, but since then, um, since around um, August time, um, the buddy scheme was transferred over to, to me and my team. Um, and it, it has, has looked at, at um, how we can support it more sustainably moving forward um, through volunteering, um, both council volunteers, but also, um, as I said, volunteers in the community and community groups. Um, this, this is very much a partnership with Garvo and their support um, has been absolutely outstanding on this. Um, we have managed to, um, to train up a whole cohort of, uh, of volunteers, both council volunteers and external volunteers, with all the appropriate training that they require so that they are both safe um, and that they are um, providing the appropriate support. Um, we've also been delivering support to the community groups, um, those that actually are um, receiving referrals um, for us and supporting our individuals. <clears throat> we've moved it very much to volunteer support and attempting to promote independence. So we have contacted every single person that was on the, um, the vulnerable list that was receiving support and identifying what their support needs are moving forward, whether they can actually um, no longer receive support through the buddy scheme um, uh, or whether actually they have a wider range of support needs that, that need to be assisted with. Um, through the report to Cabinet, we had additional resources to appoint staff, um, some in my team, but also in, in, um, in Garvo. And we have a joint appointment, and I think Chris is, is on um, in the meeting today. And Chris Nottingham, um, who is the volunteer coordinator, um, whose support I, ca I can say has been absolutely outstanding since the beginning of this. Um, in, ca in Cabinet in November, we had approval for Cavilli Cares. We've now established the phone line and the inbox. Um, and we're undertaking some process map mapping with the, with the transformation team to see how um, the model um, can be delivered moving forward. Um, and um, just after Christmas, we got um, um, awarded um, with 200,000 from Welsh Government for the COVID recovery grant, which will assist us to support the delivery of Caffili Cares. Um, this year, I'm afraid, because it's um, £200,000 we have to spend before the 31st of March. Um, <laughs> so no small feat, um, but um, welcome all the same. Um, and as I said, um, the team will transfer um, to social services from the 1st of February. Um, the next slide, please. Um, the long term vision is actually that, um, that the, there's a much larger range of services work collaboratively under the umbrella of Caffili Cares. Um, our aim being to support um, early intervention and prevention um, to, the, for, to meet the needs of residents of the Caffili Borough. Um, focus on uh, reducing inequalities and supporting the most vulnerable. Um, it's a preventative service aimed really at, 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 at people avoiding people having to go in for statutory provision. Um, the legacy in learning will be important. Um, it'll be important in the context of Team Caffili transformation and other strategic um, aims um, of the council, including empowering our communities um, and developing proud and trusted staff. As I said, it's a key element of the council's strategic recovery framework. Thank you. That's it. Let's hand on to questions. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, yes, we have a couple of hands up from members. Um, so, Councillor Kevin Etheridge, please, first. Yeah, could I um, could I make a suggestion? Because I'm going to have to apologise in a minute because I'd have to leave for another meeting. But can I ask uh, Tina and David? Um, we all, I think every one of us here will you know, want to drive this forward and we'd want to help as much as possible. So I would like to throw in a suggestion uh, to, to members and David and Tina. Would it be possible to sort of develop a community group engagement committee? So we as elected members and the voluntary sector um, can take, can, 
can support and help this through communication, engagement, best practice, working together, equality, uh, and sort of peer mentoring, involving in the resources and the collaboration. Um, if we can't do that, could, would it be possible to have a task and finish group where we can, you know, we can have, we can involve these people and, you know, we can give them the support of Caffili Council. Now, I appreciate, you know, Garvo and officers are doing that, but I, I believe that elected members should take more of a sort of hands-on approach and drive this through to give the, the council, you know, the, the team Caffili approach. Thank you. Chair. Yes. Um, sorry, Simon Ellington. Um, for some reason, the system won't allow me to put my hand up. Um, so apologies for just jumping in. Yes, OK. Do you want to go ahead, um, Simon, or do you want an answer from the officers with regard to Council Etheridge's um, suggestions? So, sorry, I'll, I'll wait for the answer. Thank you. Um, Tina, do you wish to come back in with this, please? Or David, Keith Street? I, I, just just to say to Councillor Atheids, th thank you for the suggestion. Ob obviously, that's a little cold at the moment. I can see where Councillor Etheridge is coming from, absolutely. Uh, it's certainly something myself and Tina will take away from the meeting. And perhaps, Kevin, we can have a conversation with you outside of the meeting to explore that a little further. Um, and understand how that can be done because because I think you know you're absolutely right. What we wouldn't want to do here is tread on anyone's toes. So we want discussions with Garvo and indeed other organisations to make sure that we don't duplicate what they do, and anything we do sort of enhances that offer really. So you know, get where you're coming from absolutely, and perhaps we can follow that up after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I think the next person with their hand up was actually Judith. Um, well, um, uh, yes, I'm ha very happy for Simon Ellington to go before me because he may be uh, mentioning something that I would have asked anyway. So, and I've got another question. So, can Simon go first and then come back to me? Yes, certainly. Simon from uh, our Citizens Advice Bureau, would you like to go ahead, please? Thanks, and thanks, Judith. Um, all I wanted to say really was um, I'm really supportive of the Caffili Cares um, initiative. I think it's taking, um, it's building on an appalling situation and taking forward the positives from that and looking at new ways of working. And I just wanted to say that we'd be, in Citizens Advice, we'd be very keen to work as closely as possible with Caffili Cares. One of my real concerns is the there are very clearly established links between debt and mental health. Um, and we believe that when the controls that there are on creditors at the moment come off, um, the level of there's been a huge increase in the level of domestic indebtedness. When those controls come off, a lot more people are going to find themselves under a lot of pressure on top of dealing with COVID and everything else. The mental health implications of that are going to be very great. There are also established, not quite as well established, but also links between mental health and fuel poverty. And those are areas that that, that we can assist with. And um, really, I just want to sort of pledge our support for the Caffili, Caffili Cares programme going forward. Thank you, Simon. That's that's really it's very reassuring. We know the work that you cover and you can see it at the front door. These people who are in a terrible state over the circumstances they find themselves in. Um, Dave or Tina, do you wish to come back on Simon's response, please? Uh, oh, just to say thank you to Simon, really. Obviously, um, we've got a very long standing partnership with, with Simon and Simon and I have known each other for many, many years. Um, we would also welcome, um, welcome support and partnership work with him moving forward, definitely. Thank you both. Um, Judith, would you like to come in now, please? Yes, well, the first um, question really is that uh, to what extent to the council really going to try and take over from the voluntary sector. I know I'm 
playing devil's advocate, but I think this is something that's got to be raised. Raised Because I understand, for instance, that the council are now going into, in the form of the legacy team or regeneration uh, team, uh, uh, are going to start doing debt advice um, in general. I think um, at the moment, council do it for tenants of council properties. But um, if, if the council start taking over debt advice, which actually citizens advice do uh, probably better, um, I, I, that might not be um, really to the benefit of our local residents. We've had um, uh, incidences in the past where the council have taken over some of the voluntary sector work. One of them was in the grant funding when the council appointed officers who were supposed to help with funding. Well, anybody needing funding would go to Gina. They'd go to Garva because that's an accepted their ex Gina's an expert and um, they're, they're, that's the... Um, known route to get funding advice. So the council have to be very careful that they don't tread on the toes of the voluntary sector and take over things that um, actually voluntary sector would do better. This happens in social services to some extent as well. So I'd like a comment on that, please. Uh, and the second, the second thing is carers. Um, during the COVID crisis, uh, a certain number of relatives uh, have taken, have um, done the work of um, daycare staff, uh, um, sorry, domestic um, care staff, because they feared for anybody else coming into the house. They feared that their housebound loved one uh, might get COVID from a carer coming in. So to the great detriment of themselves, they took over. Now, I don't think um, that really those people can expect to be to continue. They can't spend the rest of their life um, really um, doing work that previously the council did. Uh, so I'd like a comment on that as well, please. Uh, Chair, 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 Chair. Um, could you take your hands back, uh, button down now, please? And I'll call in Mr. Dave Street. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Judith. Two, two excellent questions. Uh, first things first, we're absolutely not wanting to take over or tread on the toes of anyone at all. Quite the opposite. Uh, what we want to do is enhance the, the sort of role the voluntary sector and other community groups actually play in the borough. Uh, I can't talk about what's happened historically, um, but certainly from our end, um, we don't want to tread on anyone's toes. In fact, in a perfect world, we'd quite like people to tread on our toes. And if there are things that the community groups and the voluntary sector could do that historically we've done as a local authority, then we'll be absolutely up for that dialogue. I think Simon hit the, hit the nail on the head. Uh, we've got a good relationship with Stephen and Garvo, and as I said, this isn't any kind of takeover. It's not us moving into that territory. I'll ask Tina to co comment on the debt advice in a moment. Um, going back to your point around unpaid carers, which again is another excellent point, it's tricky. Um, our day centres have been closed since uh, the initial outbreak. They remain closed and they will remain closed for the foreseeable future. Um, in all of those instances where families have found themselves without daycare, we have offered support within the community. Not all those families want that support because of the reasons you lay out. They don't want strangers going into their homes. They don't want strangers interacting with people who they perceive to be vulnerable. The only light at the end of that tunnel, I think, is vaccination. I think as the vaccination um, program uh, moves through our communities and it seems to be moving through quite nicely, then hopefully we'll have a level of confidence of people that they'll be prepared to engage with services again. Um, interestingly, one of the, the issues that we're going to have moving forward is we've had lots and lots of feedback from people who, primar who have previously been having services in day centres. They are, their loved ones are finding those services in the communities much more beneficial. So it'll give us an opportunity to the way, look at the way we provide those services going forward. I'm not underestimating at all the burden our unpaid carers are carrying. We are continuing to encourage people to engage with us, but there is still a significant proportion of our population that, to be quite frank, is frightened. Tina, do you want to come back in on the, the debt advice issue? Yeah, I, I mean, I think just just to clarify, really, um, as I said before, we, we have we have always had a very good working relationship with the Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, in fact, um, in normal times when we 
have our buildings um, and we provide support from our buildings. The Citizen Advice Bureau actually delivers sessions for us directly. We've always referred to them. Uh, my team are not experts in debt advice and, and would not be able to provide debt advice um, under any circumstances. The council does provide um, advice through the council's housing um, support team. Um, that is maximising income advice um, and benefit maximisation advice. They also refer for specialist debt advice in, into suit into Citizens Advice Bureau. So we have, we have no intentions of, of doing the work of, of the voluntary sector, which which they do very well. Um, and this, as I, as, as I was trying to um, demonstrate in the presentation, this is very much about a partnership with our um, voluntary and community groups and actually trying to support them um, moving forward um, to, to actually um, deliver the services them, themselves. So uh, uh, no intention of that at all, Judith. Can can I come in there? Uh, yes, um, uh, Michelle Jones, Parent Network Vice Chair, please come in. Thank you. All I wanted to, oh, sorry, there's a bing. Um, all I wanted to say really was um, on a much lower level of support, I think some of the things that uh, has been a bit of a barrier to, to some of the voluntary organisations and maybe to a lot of the families that we've been working with has been red tape. So a community will come up with a brilliant idea and then realise that actually we shouldn't be doing that at all. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to the Kafili Cares model because it will enable us to support our families to do things for themselves, but to maybe get that information right about what we should or shouldn't do, you know, and whether we are allowed to put up posters and whether we are allowed to to plant things in little spaces of green that maybe are not being used. So it's I know this is a very much on a lower level and this is probably on our journey out of um, the situation we're in now and, and that community coming together and coming out on the other side. But I really welcome the opportunity to be able to sort of get that additional support within uh, the council to be able to give us the red light or the or the green light, depending on what we've decided or what that community has decided they'd like to do. So um, I know we fell foul a couple of times over Christmas, so apologies for that. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, Mr. Chris Nottingham um, from Garvel, please. Chris, are you able to communicate with us? Oh, sorry, mute. Um, hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As Tina mentioned, I'm the volunteer coordinator for the Buddy Scheme, and I just thought I would um, add my perspective. It might be um, a useful bit. Um, yeah, we've had some really committed and excellent volunteers, both from the council and the um, and the community, and. Um, yeah, in the current period it is it is a firefighting sort of um, helping those residents who are shielded in, during the lockdown period. But moving forwards out of lockdown, um, I just see the, the huge potential for those volunteers to be like uh, the conduits to to the community and to sort of link those um, those services that the, the residents who have fallen through the net and um, just just giving them the pathway out of this fear and isolation and um, rebuilding that that trust and, and improving people's mental health and well-being. Um, so yeah, just to, to link up with the, the, the community groups is going to be a, a really useful thing with the, um, the Buddy Scheme volunteers. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, is there any more um, wishing to participate in this particular discussion i don't see any hands up michelle do you right well oh, dave yeah. and sorry dave and tina may i thank you most sincerely for your input into today's meeting uh rest assured members we've got some very very experienced people now involved in this um uh Caffini cares project and we look forward to it being taken forward Thank you both very much. And we're going on now to the next item, which is um, the third sector activities, item six, um, where we look forward to Alison Palmer's presentation with the voluntary sector. Thank you, Alison. 
Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Alison Palmer. I'm uh, now Deputy Chief Executive Officer for Garvo since last November. Um, but of course, I will have met an awful lot of you before because we've been involved with the Liaison Committee for a very long time. Usually at the Liaison Committee, we have a single presentation from a single third sector organisation. The voluntary sector reps this time would like to give you uh, an overview of some of the things that the voluntary sector have been doing during the COVID pandemic. We haven't had a, a liaison committee for um, some time, I mean, since December in 2019. And I think it's really useful for us to give you an overview of some of the things that ha have been happening despite COVID, with COVID and because of COVID. So I have a presentation to share with you. Um, I'm going to introduce um, a number of our members to give you a very brief presentation. We have a limited amount of time, so I will be nudging people along as we go. Um, but I'll, I'll start by sharing my screen and as soon as people can actually see it, uh, perhaps somebody can give me a thumbs up to make sure that they can, because I'm also monitoring the meeting chat, so my screen is a little bit busy at the moment. But I'll just share this with you now, and then I will ask the individuals to do a very short piece um, as we've arranged. First, firstly, can somebody let me know that they can see the screen? Yes. Talk, yes. Yes. Lovely. Yeah, it's fine. In which case I can carry on to the next screen and our first um, short presentation is from Lowry Jones from Mentor Kefili. Great. Thanks, Alison, and thanks all for the opportunity just to to give you a, a brief overview of our work and perhaps highlight. Uh, some of our responses during COVID um, and it's perhaps particularly um, relevant as it will be with um, all the organisations um, to think of that work now in the context of Caerphilly Cares as well. So Mental Caerphilly is the Welsh language initiative for Caerphilly Borough and we're part of a network, network of another 21 initiatives across Wales um, and we were established back in 1999 by local people um, and are run by a voluntary board um, of local people who are keen to see an organisation prioritise um, the work around increasing the opportunities to use the Welsh language on a community level. With, to put that into context, we have over 18,000 Welsh speakers in the borough um, and we have 11 Welsh primary schools and um, one Welsh comprehensive school across two sites. And, and those target audiences, children and young people, um, are key to us. We, we also work um, closely within the context of Welsh Government's 2050 target of um, encouraging and ultimately producing one million Welsh speakers. Uh, and more closer to home, um, possibly, uh, work very closely with the local authority within their five-year Welsh language strategy um, and would be extremely eager now to see our work um, developing within the context of Caerphilly Cares um, as well to ensure that that includes Welsh language provision across all elements um, of that new programme. So during the past 20 years, we've responded to the challenge, really, um, and the need from local communities for opportunities to use the Welsh language across all elements um, of their of their life um, and across all ages as well. Um, and what a key element for us is our large out of school childcare service. Um, which provides Welsh medium childcare for primary age children. We employ over 60 members of staff within that service um, and normally we'd be caring for over a thousand children per week, uh, currently caring for key, key worker children mainly, um, but um, that's a key service for us and also job creation with that, within that service has ensured that over 60 people within the borough can follow a career within childcare through the medium of Welsh within their within their own communities. But in addition to that, we have youth provision, which we um, manage and fund alongside the local authority for Welsh speaking, Welsh learning uh, young people. Support for adults who have learned Welsh, who are continuing to learn Welsh um, through monthly and um, weekly opportunities. Um, interest groups, 
um, and support for vulnerable adults. Uh, and during this challenging time, uh, we've seen a significant increase in demand um, and calls to us really to support adults who, ha who are vulnerable, uh, isolated, and also who have dementia. Uh, and the need for contact with the Welsh language um, has been particularly uh, strong during this time. Um, we also support businesses to increase their use of the Welsh language, work alongside other organisations to provide Welsh medium volunteering opportunities and would certainly like to tie in more um, with any volunteering developments um, and the buddy system which um, Chris referred to. We also have a large digital project which supports uh, particularly children, young people and young adults to develop Welsh medium content um, because keeping up with um, digital development and the huge interest in digital opportunities um, is key um, to ensure that the Welsh language is relevant within that field as well. Some of you may have seen our community events um, and workshops, but particularly Philly Fest, our summer festival, which is uh, held within Caerphilly Castle once a year. We normally have around 5,000 people attending, but obviously I had to transfer to a digital activity um, this year um, and um, in terms of all of our um, of our provision uh, apart from the childcare service it is all transferred to be digital um, and continues to do so um, but at, at particular points we've had over 40,000 people engaging with us digitally which has been a, a, a huge um, surprise to us really but highlighted the demand for, for these opportunities. Um, and I spoke about vulnerable adults. Um, we've seen a significant demand for support for vulnerable adults who are, um, in some cases, completely dependent on our weekly services because the Welsh language is now a huge part of their lives. Um, so we've had to adapt very quickly to support them online. And when we were allowed to do so, to support them individually um, visiting their homes and also um, outdoor activities. And we're very much looking forward to returning um, to those sort of activities. So we've certainly seen a strong link between well-being for people and the ability to use the Welsh language in their community. Um, and that's something that we'd like to explore further with, with um, the local authority and other organisations um, as different strategies develop over the coming months. Um, and as an organisation, you know, we're, we're very keen that the Welsh language um, is embedded strongly with any development such as uh, work that comes um, out of the Future um, Generations Act, local development plan, any community development plans, and, and certainly Caerphilly Cares as well, um, and would very much like to work um, with the local authority and other organisations, ensuring that Welsh medium provision runs uh, right through that, really. Um, you, you'll all be aware, I'm sure, that Welsh medium education has been a huge success story in Caerphilly Borough, and, um, you know, compared to some neighbouring authorities, um, that Welsh medium education has developed rapidly in this borough, as has opportunities for adults to learn the Welsh language. Um, but what we see as essential then is the opportunities to use that language in a meaningful way in the community so that it's relevant um, to young people's lives. It opens opportunities that there's a possibility um, to use the Welsh language within their career locally um, and also that we're able to support families to raise their, um, their children and their families bilingually. So it, it is a huge remit for us as an organisation, but as I said, referring to other strategies and local plans, um, it's something that we're keen to work alongside other organisations to achieve. And um, particularly with Caerphilly Cares and what we've heard this morning, very keen to continue to work in partnership um, to ensure that Welsh Medium provision um, is a key element um, of that work as well. So I think I've gone over my three minutes, but. Um, Really grateful for the opportunity to highlight some of our work this morning and looking forward to working in partnership over the coming months as we come out to this um, challenging period. Thank you, Lowry. Yes, you have gone over your three Sorry. minutes. Our next uh, presentation is uh, from Simon Ellington from Caerphilly and Blaine Gwen Sisters and Advice. What I would say is perhaps we could hold off on any questions until the very end because I can't see any hands up on the screen now. So um, if we can leave it until the end of the presentations and then we can 
um, we can offer any answers that anybody has any questions for. Thanks. Um, good morning. Um, I welcome the opportunity. Um, as Lowry gave a quick history, I'll do the same, but very quickly. Um, Citizens Advice has been in Kefili since um, 1939. Bargoid CAB opened in 1939, um, two days after the outbreak of war. Um, we're still we're still in Bargoid. We're still dealing with disasters. Um, we, as an organisation, as Caffili County CAB, as a countywide organisation, we've been going for 21 years. We're just coming up to our 21st birthday. Um, some of you were at our launch event in Caffili Castle 20 odd years ago. Um, Councillor Whittle spoke there. Um, so we'll be celebrating that a little later. What have we been doing since the outbreak of COVID? We moved our team to home working in mid-March. Um, that was moving 120 paid staff in back home, carrying uh, computers, chairs, desks with them. Um, since then, we've been we continued to provide the full range of services that we always have done, but we've been doing it via telephone and web chat. And over the last two or three months. Uh, we've been rolling out video interviews with the Attend Anywhere system. We've been making use of other digital facilities as well. We're also rolling out an electronic referral uh, system called ReferNet, which means that other organisations can very quickly and easily make a referral to us. One of the issues that we've had um, is I, I mean I, I mentioned a few minutes ago about the, the impact of on people's mental health over the last few months and that's on our own staff as well as on the general public and one of the things we've had to deal with is the level of well-being support we've had to give to our own home working staff um that's was slightly surprising in a sense but um it's taken up a lot of our time um over, as I say, we've continued all the services we have over the last year. We've generated two and a half million pounds in, in new income for um, Caffili residents, mostly in the form of new benefit income, most of that um, disability benefits. We have had a downturn in the number of debt inquiries, um, which really goes back to what I was saying before about the number of controls that there are on creditors so that people are not feeling the pressure at the moment. Um, universal credit issues have gone up sharply and employment inquiries have nearly doubled um, over the same period the, the year before. Um, I said our paid staff are working from home. We we lost over the last year, we've lost some of our longer term, some of our older volunteers, um, but we have taken on and recruited new volunteers, volunteers that we've we've recruited, inducted and trained entirely remotely and provided them with the training and, and equipment they need to provide telephone advice from home as well. We've also been trying to make sure that we reach the most vulnerable in the community. So we've been setting up new partnerships. So we're working very closely with organisations now like Bernardo's and like Mencap um, to make sure that we're we're hitting some of the most vulnerable um, people in Caffili. We are also working with Anar and Bevan um, to provide advice to their mental health service union users, um, as well as the organisations that we've worked with for a long time through our contracts with Families First and supporting people, so that we're, we're continuing to provide those wraparound services. Um, the digital advice has been going probably better than we expected, um, but we're still very keen to get back into the community because we know if people are digitally excluded, we are concerned that they're not reaching us. 
um, and we're we are very keen to get back out there and we will be back out there as soon as we can do it safely. Um, we were in the lucky position to be able to distribute a few hundred fuel vouchers over the last few months. That um, that scheme well, actually came to an end today. Um, we are looking at new partnerships. We are partner, uh, we're one of a consortium with Warm Wales um, who will be providing energy advice um, in a pilot scheme over the next nine months. Um, Caffili Council and United Welsh are also partners in that scheme. Um, and one of the things where we're slight, the impact on us has been slightly different to some of the voluntary sector organisations is that we've grown very sharply during the last year. We've created over 50 jobs um, since last March, um, mostly in our contact centre, um, mostly young people under 30. Um, but we're, we're very proud of the fact that during a period where a lot of people have been losing their jobs, we've been able to create new opportunities for people. Um, and I just repeat what I said earlier, that we're looking forward to continuing to work closely with the council as um, carefully cares rolls out. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. We'll move on now to, if you bear with me for the uh, slight delay, to Rod Evans, the operations manager and acting CEO for Blind and Gwent and Caffili Care and Repair. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to um, to sort of uh, showcase our service, um, and you know, such a, a at such a dreadful time as well in our in the last year. And uh, moving forward, hopefully things will be, be uh, uh, like you said, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, the impact has been uh, dreadful, to be honest. With you. Um, but as, as a third sector frontline service, it came repairs a uh, holy thos. It's been to support all the vulnerable clients within their own homes, you know, helping them to maintain their independence while staying safe and secure in a secure environment. Um, at present, we have over one and a half thousand clients within the borough, uh, which we're trying to support. I think uh, at the moment, um, due to the fact we are frontline facing service, you know, we, we haven't been able to get out to our clients' homes. Uh, we have we have um, been working digitally and remotely within the borough. Um, mm. Luckily enough, we was able to um, to receive some funding off Digital Communities Wales, which has um, helped uh, provide some laptops for our support workers to get out out uh, remote working and still have access to clients and our database. Um, at the beginning of March 2020, the agency celebrated 30 years serving the community uh, with a visit from a Royal Island's Princess Royal. Within two weeks, the country was put into lockdown. Uh, many of our clients were shielding. I'd like to take this opportunity to mention the way in which our agency uh, adapted to the change and stepped in to support our vulnerable clients. Um, with many of our partner organisations within both the counties of Blind Grand and Caffili, uh, from supporting farm, local pharmacies, uh, my staff, um, all six of them have sort of uh, managed the 1,000 medication deliveries within the counties as well as supporting clients with numerous befriending calls and grocery deliveries. Working effectively alongside health and social care, supporting reablement re and prevention within the community. Our small case work and install team have carried out over 180 safe hospital discharge referrals, enabling safe discharge back to the, the homes. We've um, we facilitated 400 preventative adaptations within the county, reducing clients' risk of falls and serious harm in and around their homes. Uh, over, over the last year, we, this has equated to around 50% increase in client referrals from colleagues in social services and health during this difficult period. The type of works has in, have included the installation of all forms of grab rails, and rails, chair raisers, the installation of key safe to uh, allow carers access to people's properties, uh, step repairs, paths, making safe access to people's homes. 
we've uh, we've we've managed to access numerous funding opportunities um, for emergency repairs, heating, gas, electrics, uh, through Nest and different organisations. Uh, during the period, we've utilised um, many different um, opportunities for clients. Uh, we've we've managed to access, um, like I said, a, a fund as well through the National Lottery to. We're looking into providing possible uh, digital equipment to, to help um, facilitate in, uh, sort of interaction for clients who are just very distanced. Um, so that's that's a project we're looking at at the moment. We have acquired some funding to help with that, and hopefully we can push it forward, providing we can um, maintain the, the correct sort of uh, Wi-Fi connections is going to be the only issues we can find at the moment. But if we can overcome that and facilitate it, we we hopefully will overcome it and um, we are speaking to a digital Wales to see if they can have some interaction with us as well hopefully in the future um, to move that on uh, as a community uh, resource um, you know I believe that our agency as, me as, as many other volunteer and third sector organizations have proved to be invaluable support in clients and our lead organizations during this difficult time as mentioned within the Kefili uh, case report, the model uh, sort of had a, a look through the, the model and drawing on many years of life experience and local knowledge, growing up within the value, uh, Valley communities has provided us with an education like no other. As to the industrial past, our demographics and the impact within our communities. Uh, coming from a construction background, planning and procedure makes things happen. But but as uh, Councillor Heather had said earlier, I, I believe that sort of inclusion and equality um that's the, the sort of way forward um the philly make a uh, case model is an ex excellent model um we'd love to be part of it um you know inclusion would be great uh it would obviously help us it would give us uh, more access the interaction between social services we already have and and you know to, to main that and maintain it and be part of the development and you know, uh, ongoing dialogue would be excellent for our for our organisation, um, you know, and our clients. And and you know, I sort of um, like a, a quote from Albert Einstein was that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use when we created them. Uh, I think that um, you know, inclusion and equality is going to be the way forward. And yeah, that's that's. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Rod. I move on now. To Roger Evans, who's going to uh, give an overarching presentation around community buildings that he and Judith have put together. Thank you, Roger. I think Roger's on mute. Sorry, I'm Sorry. I double I double clicked uh, and uh, the response was slow. I didn't realize I'd been switched off again. Oh, we've right. got you now. I shall repeat. Thanks. I shall say thanks, Alison, and good morning, everyone. Uh, just to brief participants about the role that community halls have played and are continuing to play during the pandemic. On the positive side, there's a few actions that the voluntary sector has itself taken or benefited from. And I'm sure members are well aware in their own areas of the use that community buildings have been put to for food banks, perhaps community food preparation and distribution, a base for support groups, uh, and for preschool uh, childcare provision for frontline and other workers. Many halls have received the, uh, the lockdown grants referred to earlier, um, and it's enabled them either to replace lost income or simply to keep going by paying the bills. And this has been a great support for voluntary management committees and I'm sure without it, some halls would certainly uh, not have been able to keep going, even in a mothball state. Uh, just a couple of examples of what the grants have been used for. 
that Kevin Hengard, the youth centre, has used some of the money to re-roof part of the building, and that provided work for a local builder. In Oakdale, uh, the centre upgraded an outside play area using a comic relief grant, again, which uh, Garbo was instrumental in uh, assisting with, and again, employed a local contractor to deliver the work. I'm not sure if we have any slides of that, Alison, to uh, share. The pictures are at the end, Roger. If you keep going, oh, right. I'll show them at the end. Great, thanks for that. Um, again, thanks to the council for the deep clean of kitchens and building modifications that some centres, uh, council owned centres needed to um, continue to deliver services. That again has been much appreciated. And um, another example of activities during closure is at Hengoid where the community centre uh, repainted the inside of the centre, uh, again providing work for a local painter. So those have been um, what we believe are the positive uh, actions by the voluntary sector, but we have started to face up to the challenges as we come out of the pandemic. Again, as previous uh, participants have said, we don't know exactly when normal will be the old normal or whenever, but the paperwork needed to conform with the guidance and regulations um, has been a real challenge for those centres and committees uh, of non-council owned buildings. Again, community centres within the local authority sector have appreciated all the work that's been done to provide paperwork to make it easier to tick the boxes to reopen uh, in whole or in part for services. But other centres with less professional support have found um, it a challenge to comply with all the paperwork and that could be a continuing challenge as well. Also, it's been difficult keeping everybody, um, users involved, why halls are remaining closed, particularly those running physical exercise activities. Everybody's been encouraged to keep fit during uh, lockdown, but many people use community buildings for that. And again, the management of lots of um, centres have found it difficult to keep in touch um, with their users in that area. And when we come out of lockdown, I think many buildings are going to find it challenging to try and get users to return. There is still a lot of fear in our communities. People are going to be worried whether the hall they're using um, as hygiene uh, uh, facilities in place, uh, whether they've got sufficient sanitizers, simply sharing facilities as simple as uh, teacups. Um, people are going to worry about, is it safe to go back? Um, also, I think we are going to find that some community buildings may find it difficult to reopen in any shape or form. We have to recognize in some areas there's an over provision of buildings and before we went into lockdown uh, we in the voluntary sector were working with gavo to try and come up with some sort of building survey to identify what we had uh, and that obviously needs to go forward and on the positive side of that I'm sure we can identify building resources that the Philly Cares team could use. Um, we, we talked of um, identifying what facilities there are at each building, the, um, the capacity of people that you could get in them, but lots of buildings have underused rooms that the voluntary sector could use and possibly, again, Philly Cares could use. That's the, um, what shall we say, the um, 
the hardware of the voluntary sector, the buildings. If I can refer to the people as the, uh, the software side, um, we know that we've lost volunteers and are likely to lose volunteers during lockdown. And it will be a challenge for lots of smaller organizations to recruit new people to the committee to their committees. Perhaps Gavo can look at um, providing courses for succession planning to encourage new volunteers. Some of the younger people who've uh, come forward during the pandemic to bring them on board existing organizations. Um, that's going to be a challenge for us. And the final point I'd mention, it's been referred to by other contributors this morning, um, encouraging and engaging older people particularly to engage in new technology. Again, there's a fear factor in that. Um, but surprisingly, a lot of older people, once they get their hands on to uh, equipment and are given basic training, find that they can cope with it. So uh, that's that's something else that we're encouraged by on the uh, in the voluntary sector that needs to be addressed as we move beyond the current state of uh, play. So I think that sums it up for community halls. And hopefully, yes, that's an example of what the community center in Oakdale was able to do, uh, a shaded area that wasn't much used. Um, we got a local contractor to lay some artificial turf so that the children can uh, play on it. Again, when the weather permits, yeah. it's a much needed uplift to uh, one area of the site at uh, Oakdale. So thanks for sharing that with us. Thank you, Roger. I'd like to hand over now to Judith John, the regional manager, the new regional manager for Homestart Cymru. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I, I am here, but <laughs> I've still, still got pictures. Should I just start anyway? Yes, we can hear you, Judith, so you yeah, can carry fine. on. Yeah, right. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. As you, as you say, I'm the new regional manager now for Homestart Cymru, and I've taken over from, I'm sure you knew, my colleague, uh, Melanie Snowden. My previous area... Well, I've been in Homestead a long time, about 17 years, and my previous area was I was the manager of the Cardiff scheme. As some of you will know, Homestead Cymru is, you know, it's a volunteer-led family support charity, and we're now based in a, a lot of communities across Wales. And we've got a network now of trained volunteers who support families with young children when they're facing challenging times. Um, home, I'll just give you a little background. Homestart Cymru uh, came into came into being on the 1st of July in 2019, where seven of the smaller local homestarts came from across Wales um, came together in that merger, and we actually merged Blaina Gwent, Caerphilly, Cardiff, Carmarthen, Denbyshire, Monmouthshire, uh, Rhondacan and Tav, and Merthyr. And by the end of last year, we had over 300 volunteers. We supported over, we're supporting over eight, 800 families, and that would be to 1,721 children. As you can imagine, the challenges, you know, due to the pandemic for families has been, you know, has been huge. And like our, my previous, uh, you know, colleagues have said before, that we had to move to remote working as we were no longer able to home visit, um, which was quite big for us because obviously Home Start is all about visiting families, you know, families in their family home. So the remote working, so we did a lot of phone support. We phoned, text, WhatsApp the families. There was a lot of practical help we helped families uh, access food banks we did shopping for them if they were sort of isolating or shielding um, we helped them with their school vouchers because obviously some of them couldn't access their you know the free school meal vouchers 
and that picked up medication. So we were hoping, I think like a lot of people, that we would be returning to the, the office, but that didn't happen. Um, and we're still in the same situation now. So what we've looked at now, we've done a lot of virtual groups. So on Zoom, we'll bring families together. We'll perhaps send out an activity for the children and then all the families will come together with the members of staff and do those activities um, over Zoom. You know, we do a lot of the do mentioned as a, the doorstep deliveries, the remote support. So it's emotional support over the phone. It is quite frustrating because, you know, especially when we've got mums who've got twins and triplets, we have a, quite a few multiple births and, you know, what they really are looking for is that hands on support in the home, which we're unable to do. So we have got uh, the Rainbow Project. We were lucky to have funding through um, WCVA. So the Rainbow Project now is in a number of areas. And again, that is bolstering what we do by offering, you know, doorstep and emotional support. Um, I think, you know, because families have had like a lot of, they've got less family support now because sometimes grandparents or other members of the family, you know, as you say, are shielding or isolating. And on the note of volunteers, we would really welcome all volunteers, you know, older volunteers as well, because as we know, you know, older volunteers bring such a lot of a wealth of experience to young families who perhaps haven't got that sort of mother figure, grandmother figure, you know, who and they can do that from their own home. We've now offer remote training. So but that can, you know, that can be done over WhatsApp. I know we've mentioned earlier sort of the the problems of you sort of perhaps if people you know are, haven't got access you know to the to a digital means so we've also got other projects we've got a helping working families project which is funded through the big lottery we've got big hopes big futures which is all about families who well it's i was going to say what it should be is school ready but not the schools are in at the moment, but that will help families around routines, nutrition, helping them what would be getting the children ready for school. But we can help now with sort of those resources as well to help with home learning. Um, in cards, if we've got a refugee and asylum project funded through the Tudor Trust, and we work on, uh, we have a neurodevelopment project as well for children who are on the neurodevelopment pathway. So we are now looking to centralise our volunteers and our volunteer recruitment. And actually the recruitment of volunteers through this time has been really successful. And also the digital training has been really successful. So even though it's been very different for us over the last few months, you know, well, almost a year, I should say, I think we all you know, can't believe how we had to go to the remote support and I think, like people have said before me, we've all managed in some way to offer support to families. So, you know, and I think that's been really important. It may be different, but we're still doing. So, yeah, and I would at the end, obviously, I would welcome more questions off anyone. Thank you, Judith. Our, our final contribution um, you've already heard from Chris this morning, but just a quick one from Chris. Chris Nottingham, our Community Response Volunteering Coordinator. I, yeah, just to add what I said previously, um, I'm building a team of uh, buddy volunteers who are out in the community providing essential support um, in terms of um, shopping prescriptions and in the more holistic um, befriending doorstep chats, telephones um, and really looking to put um, put people back into the community and put them in a better place um, leaving the pandemic from what they went into it. Um, the contribution from uh, Caffili Council employees has been um, absolutely um, first class. Um, their dedication to, to provide that support and we've had um, people who started volunteering in March who have developed such incredible relationships with the people they're supporting. Um, and I think those the, the the way the buddy scheme is building relationships with um, the vulnerable adults that uh, are being supported is really going to help um, help in the future. And um, 
yeah, any any um, we, we as Roger was saying that uh, you, you've lost some volunteers from the from older sections of society that they're um, we're finding that we're getting lots of volunteers who've never volunteered before, um, and that's uh, just a fantastic um, story, and that's going to be um, increasing with any support um, from the uh, employer supported policy that the, the council can provide in the future and and as we widen that recruitment into the community it's uh, really going to be a, a benefit to those residents that we're helping. Thank you very much Chris. Um, I've just put up on the last screen the, the current membership of the Voluntary Sector Representatives Committee. You haven't heard from everybody today because we couldn't possibly fit everybody in obviously. Um, I know we've gone over time, but I think it was really important that you hear from some of the organisations that have carried on regardless, if you like. So we will make sure that you get this presentation with the contact details of the organisations. I'll stop sharing now and I'll hold, I'll hand back over to our chair, Councillor Ellsworth, to finish off. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alison, for organising that presentation. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I would ask if there is any uh, brief questions that you want to uh, give members to the voluntary sector. Is there anybody with a, a burning question they might wish to raise? I don't see any hands up. But um, um, certainly, do you know, this committee always brings something fresh and something to learn about every time I attend. Uh, and to know from Lowry, for example, that we've got 18,000 Welsh speakers within the county borough. Oh, I didn't know that. So that was very interesting. And it, it, it goes some way towards the one million that the Welsh government seem to want to achieve in future. Um, you know, it's, it's been so interesting knowing that um, the 21 years of CAB in Caerphilly um, and previously when it was set up in 1939, Simon, as, as you explained, again, you know, interesting facts. And a, another fact is I can remember you coming along to Caerphilly and being employed by CAB. I think you came from England and you have stayed put in Wales, so that was a big bonus to us. Many, many thanks to you all for doing what you do. And it has been very difficult times. And I hope that we will see new volunteers coming forward in the future to replace the ones who've sadly had to retire for all manner of reasons. Um, the item seven on our agenda now is items of, of interest concerning the voluntary sector from Compact Partners. Alison, uh, have you got anything to say on this item, please? Uh, no, if um, from the point of view of Garvo, Steve Tiley is in the meeting, so uh, Steve can give you an update. Thank you. Steve Tiley, please. Um, I, I haven't got much of an update to come from a Garvo point of view, um, only that um, the pandemic um, from, a, from an organisational point of view is, has, has been... Um, you know, for us, it's been really sort of a bit of an eye opener, really, on how services have had to change and adapt over the last so many months. And I think that it's been um, it's been enlightening to see how 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 the sort of voluntary sector has uh, responded. Um, we pick up on the comments about the volunteers, etc. And it's been really, um, you know, if there are any type of positives that come out of this terrible time, is that there are a lot of younger volunteers now who are getting involved and trying to sort of make a make a sort of um, a real impact in their communities and hopefully that'll continue on and from a gavel point of view it's just to sort of raise it i mean we since i've come in i, I i've been in this role now since last april uh, obviously allison's come in now to help from a gavel point of view in november so what we're looking at now as an organization is to um uh, do a little bit of a restructure in a sense of being more sort of um area focused uh, whereas in the past we sort of focused on being teams we're looking at sort of adapting that now so we can be a little bit a uh, bit more um, sort of able to change quicker with uh, with some of the things that are going on in each of the areas. So that'll be quite an interesting time for us as an organisation and it allows us to be uh, more responsive and be able to sort of help and move towards more of the um, 
sort of local local requirements really so so that's gonna be an interesting time moving forward and COVID has certainly highlighted that each area is very different for us to work in and um you know it's in it's it is exciting that we've been um been able to come along with it with the Kafili journey through this and work with all the great partners and um various different organizations that we've been able to work with so that's a bit from me thank you very much steve for that update um, well, members, I think we have come to the end of today's meeting and it's sad in a way because we can't all physically meet up with each other as we usually do in these meetings when we have them at Penalta House. But nevertheless, we've achieved a meeting which is very important. Thank you all so very much for being with us this morning and um, to the officers of the County Borough, to the voluntary sector, members who we are so very grateful to, to the support from our Kafili officers in running this meeting, which helps me enormously. Uh, thank you all. Good morning and have a nice lunch. Bye. See, end of the meeting.